Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Serial Talker podcast. My name is Peter Von Gom, and this is episode four. Now, I'm going to cut right to the chase. This episode of the podcast is not your juice and cookies episode of the Serial Talker podcast. We're going to be talking about some of the most horrific, heinous, and evil methods of execution from antiquity through the Middle Ages and even into the 19th century. This stuff is really, really, really horrific. It'll make you serial killers, you murderers, adulterers, and heretics really happy that you're living in the 21st century. Because if you were living back then, pulling the crap you're pulling now, (laughs) you would be in for a real, real fright. Let's roll back the clocks way back for this horrific true story. The year is 470 BC. In a small village in ancient Persia, there was an execution about to take place using a method known as scaphism, the boats. It comes from the ancient Greek word of skaphe, which means to be hollowed out. Typically, logs or boats were used in this execution. The village was a buzz with fervor, revenge, and nervous excitement. He could have run. He should have run. He knew what was about to unfold as punishment for his crime. He wasn't bound. Only his arms were held by the elders, leading him down a path to the bog. But where would he go? It was a small village and nothing but desert in all directions. As he was escorted to the site, the congregation hurled slurs and insults, the least of his worries. He was resigned to his fate issued by the court, the cruelty of it. The day was sweltering, hot and humid. All in attendance were uncomfortably sweating, not only due to the heat, but perhaps more from the anticipation of what they were about to witness. For most, this was not their first view to such a heinous castigation. They were obligated by law of the village to bear witness. Who would dare walk the same path ever again, knowing what harsh punishment would be meted out? The scene is unfolding along a murky green bog, filled with tepid water, so wretched nothing survives in it other than the algae that paints it green and the swarms of mosquitoes, horseflies, and water skippers buzzing along the surface. The villagers are all swathed in loose clothing, protection from the pests and the punishing sun. Ravens soar high above in anticipation of the activities. Their glee was palpable. They've seen this before too. Their meal was not far away. The attendees are informed of the crime by the attending tribunal that is made up of the village elders. The crime committed was truly heinous, and the punishment will be equally heinous, an eye for an eye. Set along the shore are two weathered wooden rowboats and two large clay vessels covered with cloth, a magnet for the bugs excitedly buzzing around them. The boats have been modified. Holes are cut out of the hulls of each rowboat through which the head and arms can protrude. The condemned is made to lie down in one boat. His arms and legs are tied and pushed through the circular cutouts. Then the second boat is placed atop the first so that the person's head, feet, and arms are all now protruding from the contraption. But the rest of his body is sandwiched between the boats. They are then bolted tight together. The vessels are opened, one filled with honey, the other with hot curdled milk. With the condemned now unable to move and whimpering, the executioner pours the liquids into the victim's mouth and on his face until he gags, the thick honey clogging his airways. Then the remaining amounts are poured over his exposed skin. His feet and arms are lathered in the sweet liquids. 
The bugs have already begun their task, a role pivotal to the executioner's success. He's pushed off the shore and allowed to float out into the hot sun on the bog. There, he will remain until he dies, a slow, horrific death, either from exposure to the scorching sun, from the insect bites, or from aspirating his own vomit. Every day, the executioners will visit the condemned and do their best to prolong the man's life, a slow, merciless death is ideal. He will be given water to help sustain his life, and more honey and milk lathered on generously. His flesh rotting away in his own filth and devoured by worms, he dies a lingering and horrible death. Whether that takes a few hours or a few days, it makes no difference. The scene evokes a sense of horror and dread like few others, the idea of swarms of insects and ravens picking your flesh clean while you're still alive is disturbing indeed. The idea of being hopelessly trapped as you float in the hot sun surrounded by ravenous pests, nauseous and covered in sticky, disgusting curdled milk and honey is truly horrendous. This punishment was allegedly devised by the ancient Persians as far back as 500 BC. The first person to be accused of leveraging such a horrible sentence was the Persian emperor Artaxerxes against a Persian soldier by the name of Mithridates. You see, Mithridates was charged with killing Artaxerxes' brother, Prince Cyrus, unaware of who he was. And although the two brothers were competing for the throne, Artaxerxes was not pleased with this senseless killing and ordered Mithridates be dealt with accordingly via the boats. The execution is said to have lasted more than two weeks. When the boats were separated, creeping things and vermin sprung from the corruption and rottenness of his body. His flesh had been devoured, and swarms of noisome creatures were busily feeding off of the corpse. Now that I've got your attention, let us continue with some more of history's most macabre forms of execution. The Wheel, aka the Breaking Wheel, or the Catherine Wheel. This was a torture method used for public execution, primarily in Europe, from antiquity through the Middle Ages into the early modern period, reserved for men convicted of aggravated murder. Although there were a few methods for utilizing the wheel, like dropping a heavy cartwheel onto a victim that is tied to the ground and therefore breaking their bones, the outcome was always death and always horrifically painful. Firstly, the delinquent was placed belly down, bound hands and feet outstretched to a board, and dragged by a horse to the place of execution. The heavy wheel is then slammed twice onto each arm, once above the elbow, once below. Then, each leg gets the same lovely treatment above and below the knees. Next is the final blow given to the middle of the spine, breaking the back and rendering the victim paralyzed. The mangled, broken, but still alive victim is then woven onto the wheel between the spokes, Easy to do when the limbs are all broken and pliable like rubber. The wheel is then hammered onto a pole, which is then fastened upright, similar to a cross for a crucifixion. There he is left for all to see and to slowly die an excruciating death. Although this form of execution was primarily reserved for the most violent of men, medieval records indicate that St. Catherine of Alexandria was sentenced to be executed on one of these devices for refusing to renounce her Christian belief. Now, legend has it she was about to have her spin with this wheel of misfortune when the wheel miraculously fell apart when she touched it, thereafter becoming known as the Catherine Wheel. But that small work of magic wasn't enough to stop the executioner who used a simpler, fail-safe method of simply lopping her head off. 
In autumn of 2013, the skeleton of a man was found in Germany whose signs of injury indicate death by the braking wheel. Based on an iron belt buckle at the excavation site, the skeleton was dated between the 15th to 17th centuries. His identity is unknown. However, the last known execution by this most inhumane form of capital punishment was on August 13, 1841, when Rudolf Kunopel met his fate via the wheel. Had enough? We're just getting started. Next up, the Brazen Bull. Oh, this is wicked. Often called the Sicilian Bull, this ingenious form of execution originated with the Greek tyrant Phalaris around 570 BC. This sadistic device consisted of a bronze life-size cast of a bull. The bull housed a hollow chamber where victims were deposited through a trap door. Then, a fire was kindled beneath the bull, turning the sculpture into an oven. Phalaris requested musical-like pipes be inserted into the nostrils of the bull, which were hollow. So, when the occupant shrieked and roared in unremitting agony, his cries would come through the pipes as, quote, the tenderest, most pathetic, most melodious of bellowings. Your victim will be punished, and you will enjoy the music. This truly was one sick tyrant, such ingenious and twisted cruelty. Ironically, it was the bull that killed Phalaris when he was overthrown around 20 years later. A mob seized him, bundled him inside the bull, and they had a Sicilian barbecue. And that's no bull. In keeping with the animal theme here, next is death by pachyderm. Now, in parts of southern Asia, elephants were trained executioners, and the cost to employ them was peanuts. They were used in public arenas to carry out death sentences, to crush, dismember, and torture prisoners, especially mutinous soldiers. Because elephants are such intelligent animals, they were able to take directions well. Of course, an Asian elephant could kill a victim immediately with the sheer weight of it, if that was the desired outcome. But the punishment could also be drawn out if the executioner were feeling particularly vindictive. Often, it would take hours for a victim to die. Vindictive rulers were especially fond of using elephants to kill enemies, not just for the sheer horror of it, but also for psychological reasons. Death by elephant signified both absolute power over man as well as man's control of nature. A combination of the two was thought to be the most complete form of power, validating the ruler's position. While the practice was suppressed and eventually eradicated, thankfully, during the 18th and 19th centuries, when European colonization popularized more stealth forms of torture and suppression, many travel logs recounting public executions by elephant still exist. God, can you imagine? I think I would prefer the immediate form of execution by pachyderm. Think exploding watermelon. If this next one doesn't get to you, the Judas Cradle. During the medieval times in Europe, various cruel torture devices were invented for different purposes. Most importantly, these devices were invented and improved upon when the institution of Inquisition was in full force during the late medieval times. Some of the most brutal torture devices used during this period were, a couple we've already talked about, the brazen bull, Scold's bridle, which was an instrument of punishment that consisted of an iron framework that enclosed the head and was mainly for public humiliation, the rack, chair of torture, pair of anguish, now, this is a real gem. This was made of iron and was shaped like a pear. It had leaves on it that would slowly separate from the main part of the device as a screw was turned at the top. Might I add, this was placed into any given orifice on the human body 
causing massive internal damage. This was not an execution device, but shall we say a little appetizer prior to a full course execution. Breast Ripper. Man, these people were brutal. In the Holy Roman Empire, as with many other countries through the Middle Ages, executions were never performed in a humane way. The more torturous, the greater the deterrence. The more heinous the crime, the more ungodly pain to be inflicted. A horrific death sends a powerful message to the witnesses of a public execution. One of the most brutal and most commonly used devices was called the Judas Cradle. Of course, Judas was Jesus' pal that ratted him out for a handful of silver. Now, this most effective execution and torture device was a wooden pyramid-shaped structure onto which the naked victim was lowered via a series of pulleys and ropes. His or her hands and legs would be tied so that the weight could not be shifted elsewhere. The pointed edge of the pyramid was slowly inserted in the anus, or in the case of women, the other neighboring orifice, and the sentencing commenced. This could continue for a few hours to entire days. The time, however, also varied from victim to victim, depending on various factors, including the severity of their crime. Sometimes the victim was raised with the ropes and given a little breather, but this was not done out of mercy, mind you, only to prolong the pain and misery of the victim. For added cruelty, weights were added to the victim's legs as well as oil added to the device, which increased the depth of insertion and, most certainly, horrific pain. This also usually resulted in quick death. Okay, you get the point. Note to self, if I ever go back in time, don't piss off the rulers. This next execution method was reserved in ancient Rome for the Vestal Virgins. Now, The Vestal Virgins were the priestesses to Vesta, the goddess of home and hearth, and held one of the most important religious roles in Rome. When they acted up, they were sentenced to the vicious execution of immuration. That's being sealed permanently in an enclosed space until death. The Vestal Virgins acted as religious symbols of Rome as well as the representations of the city and its citizens. They were expected to remain a symbol of purity, for as long as they were to remain both pure and unharmed, so would the city they signified. As such, Vestal Virgins were expected to make a lifetime commitment to the role and the rules that came with it. This included a vow of chastity for 30 years. Because the Vestal's purity was both highly visible and holy, penalties for breaking her vow were draconian. If a Vestal Virgin was found to have had sexual involvement, she was paraded around the city, shamed and humiliated, before her horrific sentence was carried out. As it was forbidden to shed a Vestal Virgin's blood, and no one wanted to be responsible for her death, and thus become tainted themselves, the method of execution was immuration, being bricked up in a chamber with nothing but a lamp and a small amount of food, sealed in and left to die. Punishment for her sex partner was just as brutal, death by whipping. Throughout Roman history, there are recorded instances of these grim sentences being carried out. Man, the Romans. Okay, here's your last heinous execution method for today. Poena cule, punishment of the sack. In Roman law, different forms of murder entailed different forms of punishment, depending upon the severity of the murder. Parricide, killing one's own parent or parents, sought a crueler form of punishment than other forms of homicide. When a person was convicted of the crime, they were condemned to poena cule, punishment of the sack not to be confused with a quarterback's fate at the hands of the defensive end. This form of capital punishment required the condemned to be whipped before putting a wolfskin bag over their head and made to wear heavy wooden clogs. 
The condemned was then put into an ox leather sack. Sound lonely? No worries. A live dog was tossed into the sack along with a rooster, a viper, and a monkey. They were all then taken to a river or the sea by black oxen and thrown into the water to drown. Poinakule was rarely used as a form of punishment. It said only those who confessed to patricide, the killing of one's father, matricide would be the killing of one's mother, were actually sentenced to Poenacule. In the year 118, Emperor Hadrian allowed Poenacule to be substituted, with the condemned being thrown to wild beasts. But only a century later, the practice was considered obsolete. And there you have it, guys. Those are some of the most horrific, heinous, draconian, and evil execution methods man has ever dreamt up. Have you had enough? I certainly have. All right, guys. Thank you always for joining the podcast. And if you would like to support these programs, you could always buy me a cup of coffee. The details are in the description. And if you have your own true story you would like to submit to me to consider reading, the email is also in the description. See you again soon.